fields of the wood. It's called the biblical wonder of the 20th century. In truth, this biblical theme park is a child of the 20th century because of the events that led to its development. It was in 1903 that a small group of people gathered in a house where the Arise Shine marker now stands to worship God and seek divine guidance. From this group sprang an organization that was to cover the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what Fields of the Wood is all about. Every marker preaches the word. The truth is exalted in this mountain. Fields of the Wood was still in the stages of early development in the 1940s. Trails led up Ten Commandment Mountain and Prayer Mountain, and people pulled on ropes to ascend the steep slopes. Briars and yellow jackets dominated the valley. The Ten Commandments were constructed of painted lumber. Pavement, sidewalks, and steps were non-existent. The place of the altar was marked only by a small pile of stones and a sign that designated where a great man of God had prayed for a spiritual revelation on June 13, 1903. Much of the design for Fields of the Wood was done by L.S. Rhodes, who worked along with A.J. Tomlinson, then General Overseer of the Church of God. Together with the church, they felt that this place must speak to people about Jesus Christ and His plan for God's people to be one. This was the motivation, and this is the purpose. Your tour guide today is Elwood Matthews, communication minister for the Church of God of Prophecy, the sponsors of this biblical park. Brother Matthews is the speaker on The Voice of Salvation, an international television and radio program. Located in the Smoky Mountains near Murphy, North Carolina, Fields of the Wood has received worldwide attention because of its uniqueness. But as you begin this tour, we hope that you won't view Fields of the Wood as just a tourist attraction or even a shrine or monument. We pray that you'll feel God's presence in this place and that you'll see Christ as He is presented in the Scriptures. Hello there and welcome to Fields of the Wood. Today you're in for a most exciting tour because you're going to be touring a 200-acre park that is perhaps one of the most unique places in the United States. In this park, you're going to be able to see the longest altar in the world, the largest cross in the world. You're going to see a replica of Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, also a replica of the tomb where that he rose from the dead. You'll be able to see on the side of a mountain the Ten Commandments in five-foot tall letters and many, many other things. So let's go and see what it's all about here in Fields of the Wood. Over 100,000 people visit this biblical theme park every year. Some of the people are just traveling through and they are here to sightsee. Others come to study God's Word as it is written on the various markers here. And then there are other people that just come to relax and to enjoy the atmosphere and the Spirit of the Lord that they feel here. You will notice that I'm standing under a huge star. That star represents Jesus Christ, who is the very center of everything else that you see here in Fields of the Wood. There is literature in the booth for the convenience of the visitors and a place to register. Several places are provided throughout the park for visitors to give in their prayer request. There is no admittance fee here, but those who wish to make contributions can deposit them in the little church houses marked donations. And then some people just like throwing coins in the baptismal pool. A family could spend a whole day here. There's a small restaurant just a few steps from here and a picnic area bordering a small lake. There's also a religious gift shop and bookstore. This is operated here as a part of the White Wing Publishing House and Bookstore in Cleveland, Tennessee, where the headquarters for the Church of God of Prophecy is located. While we're here, let's just take a look around and visit the tomb and Golgotha. And here we are at the tomb, which is perhaps the most visited marker in Fields of the Wood. When this project first began, uh, the people wanted to display the tomb as much like the one in Jerusalem as possible. So they went over there, they got the dimensions that were needed, they came back and built it just as near as they could to the uh, tomb that's just outside the city of Jerusalem. And we want people to know that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and Jesus came forth victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and we want to keep that in our mind as we continue on in our tour of Fields of the Wood. 
And here we are now on top of Ten Commandment Mountain, which gives you an excellent panoramic view of Fields of the Wood. There are more than 300 steps up the side of this mountain, and they form the divisions of the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Of course, you don't have to climb. You can drive in your car and even go on over to the All Nations Mountain. We'll go over there in a few minutes, but now let's take a few moments to relax and take in the view. Straight across is Prayer Mountain. You can see the gate and the steps leading up to the giant altar at the top. Along the steps are markers telling 29 Bible truths. By the time you climb to the top, you will have absorbed quite a bit of the Word of God. In the valley, that little blue square is the baptismal pool, and right behind that, is an open-air pavilion where services can be held or concerts given. On the other side is what is called the Sanctuary Hall. It houses the manager, and its wraparound porch gives a place to relax with an unobstructed view of the Ten Commandments. In the center is the information booth, where we were just a few moments ago, and behind it is the replica of the tomb where we just visited, and also Golgotha. Just past the New Testament on the way to the world's largest cross, you'll see other markers. One of the favorites is the familiar 23rd Psalm, and as a companion, there is the one shepherd marker. A little further on, we read of the nature of the church and then stop to view the inscription concerning the King of Kings. As we approach the cross, the first view is of the flags of the nations waving as they proclaim the gospel has reached these countries and that the Church of God of Prophecy has been established there. To me, the cross as it holds the world's ensigns is symbolic of Christ as he bore the sins of the world when he was crucified. And here we are at All Nations Cross. You will notice all these flags that are flying behind me. I guess there's about 90 flags there, and each one of these represents a country where the Church of God of Prophecy has a, an established church. And every time a church is established in a particular country, a new country, then the flag of that nation is placed here at what we call All Nations Cross. It is perhaps the highest spot in the park, and you can look for miles around, as you can see, and some of the most beautiful mountains and the handiwork of God that you would ever see. So I'm certain that you feel blessed by coming up here, and as we move on, you'll see more of Fields of the Wood. As we leave this wonderful view, you'll notice the old-timers trail which winds down through the trees and leads back to the valley. It would bring you out behind the gift store and picnic area. It's one of the several nature trails that visitors can enjoy in the park. But we'll drive back and then we'll head to Prayer Mountain where we'll see the world's largest altar of its kind. By the way, did you know that Fields of the Wood is taken from the Bible? You'll find it in Psalms 132. David says in verse 6, Lo, we heard of it at Ephratah, we found it in the fields of the wood. We're told that when people first settled in here, that wood was harvested from the mountainsides and rolled down into the valley. So early settlers called this place Fields of the Wood, just like we would say Fields of Corn. We hope, though, that instead of a harvest of trees, that this ministry's yield will be a spiritual harvest of souls. Another interesting tidbit of information is that when the idea of putting the Ten Commandments on the side of the mountain was first considered, the site seemed to be already prepared. No clearing had to be done, and there was no need for grading. The mountain was shaped like an open book. And now here we are at the foot of Prayer Mountain. Originally called Burger Mountain, it was renamed with the attention on prayer here. Um, I just want to thank God for another opportunity to come to this place. It's a beautiful place, and um, I'm a person that gets very emotional, and I thank God that um, so many years ago that he came into my life, and my sister-in-law came here, and she was telling us about this place, and ever since she would told us we wanted to come here, and last year was our first opportunity, and we have a, had a desire to come back, and I thank God he let us come back one more time. Just to the right of the entrance of Prayer Mountain is the Arise Shine Marker. This marks the place where a small group of people met to worship God and search His Word for spiritual light. What happened at the top of this mountain when a man named A.J. Thomason climbed it on the morning of June 13, 1903 to pray 
gives significance to this place. Let's go on up to what is perhaps the world's largest altar. It marks the spot where a man received a special revelation from God concerning his people in these last days. To many people, this is the most inspirational walk in the park. You'll notice as we climb Prayer Mountain, the steps lead past some basic 29 teachings. There are 29 of these markers, each containing a biblical truth with scriptural references. These outline a Christian's walk with God, beginning with the teaching of repentance and other experiences of salvation. These Bible teachings include the sacred ordinances and promises to the believer, and they end with warnings about things that threaten one's relationship with God. This altar has played a special role in the lives of many people. People have sought and found God here. Problems have been resolved here through prayer. Important decisions have been made here, and even weddings have been performed at this altar. But I want you to listen now as Henry O'Neill shares his reason why this place is so special to him. He wanted me to visit Fields of Woods with him. And of course, I'd heard about this altar and, uh, and the special happenings that had taken place here. And, uh, so when we first came to the Fields of Woods down in the valley here, the first place that I set out was to this altar here and, uh, and uh, because I wanted to talk to the Lord about some things that was transpiring in my life. Now, Hank, this was the first time that you had ever been to Fields of the Woods? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Fresh in from Kansas City, Missouri? Fresh in from Kansas City. First time you'd ever been to the assembly? Yes, sir. Oh, uh -huh. you were here sure enough, huh? <laughs> I was here sure enough. Okay, you said that you had some things that you wanted to talk to the Lord about. To share these with us and tell us what you're talking about. Well, I'd never been to the General Assembly before, for one thing, and uh, of course the reason I came that year was that I was 19 years old, 1A, and the Korean conflict was uh, going very strong, and I knew I'd be there in a matter of months. Now, now for these younger people that are watching us, Hank, what does 1A mean? Well, that means you're ready to go. <laughs> that's <laughs> where the, the draft was in. That's right. Yeah. For the U.S. government, that meant you were number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then you came up to talk to the Lord about that, huh? Uh, well, I came up because I knew I'd be facing things that I, uh, before that, hadn't really faced in my Christian life. I, of course, was uh, living at home and uh, felt like my life had been somewhat sheltered. I didn't know what I'd run into in, in terms of, a, of many things. And so I had some things I wanted to talk to the Lord about and whether he would actually keep that which I felt like at that time I'd committed to, yes. to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you came up here. Was it anything like it is now? Well, I don't remember all the uh, scenery around here. I do remember the hills specifically, but it was somewhat like it is uh, now. And of course, it was in uh, September, I believe. So it would have been about this month. And it would it probably, rem I don't remember all the greenery, but I remember other things quite well. I might ask if the wind was blowing like it is now with well, all I this <clears throat> wind that's carrying on. Well, I remember it actually being quite of a hot steel day, actually. Uh -huh. OK, then when you came here, this altar was like this. And, and then tell me what happened. Well, I came here, uh, knelt about five feet, as I recall, from this Just about pillar here, about, about where I'm sitting here. And of course, I began to <clears throat> ask the Lord about my future, whether it was in His hands. Uh, I wanted to know <clears throat> that my heart was right before Him and that, and that He was able to keep that which I'd given to Him <clears throat> uh, in the uh, next immediate years ahead. And so I had some talks about that uh, with him here, and, uh, and that's what I talked to him about. What happened then after that, Hank? Well, I left here, of course, and it was just a matter of a few months that I was in the military. But I remember so well, Elwood, as I, as I lifted my head uh, from this uh, place of prayer, and I prayed a long time, a long time, and I just felt the comfort of, of the Spirit of God on my life, and, and I felt just completely in the hands of God as I raised my eyes up and I looked at all these hills over here. Oh, praise God. And yes. the verse of Scripture came to me and has sort of been a blessing to me most of my life. I will look into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. And so I, my spirit was a kindred to that of David as he yeah. many years ago had, had repeated those words. And, uh, and, uh, and so I've those hills I know were there because I <clears throat> felt, in, felt in them, them the, not only the majesty of God, but I felt his greatness and his yes. vastness and that wherever I was happened to be, well, he certainly would be there and he'd give me that stability. So I left here and stayed in Cleveland, of course, <clears throat> three or four more days, I think. Actually, I was here just a short week and, and it was just a matter of months that I was in the military 
went through basic training, did end up in Korea, matter of fact. And so uh, uh, what I felt and the burden I had here came, came to pass, you know. I, I did end up in, in the U.S. military and the Army, matter of fact. And, uh, but the experience was also very helpful to me in my future life, too. Well, now, you live in Cleveland, Tennessee now, which is some, what, 60, 65 miles or something from here. Do you come here often? Has this been a special place to you, or is it something that just was at one time? Well, I, I come here quite often, Elwood. This is, has always been a special place to me. I, I bring my family here. Uh, uh, we come probably at least two or three times a year. Um, you always come up here? Oh, yes, sir. This is, <laughs> this is one of my number one places to come because I have never been here at this altar and prayed sincerely before God that, that I didn't feel His presence. Yes. Um, uh, I just think that there are special places in this world that the Lord meets with people, and I, I think, in my life at least, this is, this is really one of them. And it was, uh, it was some, well, I left here and, of course, went to Korea, and I was uh, out of service for a year and a half. Was never, I was not able to attend a local church or an uh, evangelical me meeting for a year and a half. But during all that time, I, I just felt the presence of God and His, His help to me. Uh, there was a multinational force course in Korea at that time, and I was privileged to be exposed to, uh, to the Koreans and other nationalities that were there, and, and all those things that came to be somewhat a part of my life as time went along. And so uh, we moved here to this area 20 years ago, and since that time we've come repeatedly here to this spot, and it's, it's, a, it's a real special place. And when you were in Korea, Hank, did you remember the, the presence of God as you felt it oh, yes. at that time? It was, it, was, it, was, it was always with me. And still uh, with you. It's still with me. I, I remember when I went home, and I remember the night that I was, having never been away from my family too much, I remember the night that I left to, to go to Korea, and I, and I felt the comfort and peace of God just as I'd felt it right here. I had an assurance here that, that the Lord was with me, that He would not yes. leave me nor forsake me, uh, that He would comfort me and be with me. And you know, uh, when I got to Korea, uh, of course, uh, I was one of the latter ones there, and it didn't have much rank. But uh, but I uh, got to be a uh, uh, in the I was in the Corps of Engineers in the U.S. Army, and they gave me a key to a little shop where we worked on diesel in diesel injectors, and uh, and so the Lord even made me a special place there. That so at nighttime and on the weekends and this sort of thing, I could I could go there in prayer and and Bible reading, other things that that meant so much to me. So. Uh, it all, this spirit that I found here did accompany me during my whole, my whole military life. Military life, all through your printing experiences, and now what you're doing, and right here today, same spirit. Same spirit, I feel it. Mm -hmm. God bless you, I do too, and I thank you for sharing that with us. And as we begin the descent, we see the prayer that Christ taught the disciples when they asked Him to teach them how to pray. The Beatitudes, standing on the left of the altar, facing the Lord's Prayer. These were also taught by Christ, the principles for living. It seems fitting that these words of Jesus should share the sacredness of the altar, how to pray and how to live. You have probably wondered about the red, white, blue, and purple flag you have seen here. It's called the All Nations Flag, and the church adopted it in 1933. Feeling that God's people from every nation who had come together in a holy nation should have an ensign the Church of God Assembly adopted the flag in 1933. Its design was decided upon after much prayerful thought. The red signifies the blood of Christ shed for our sins and to purchase His church. The blue stands for the truth, the white for purity, and the purple for royalty. The star, scepter, and crown symbolize Christ, His authority, and kingship. And this is the promise to the believers, a crown of life through Christ's death and resurrection. The blue diagonal stripes, you'll notice, do not make a complete square. This shows that the commission that Christ gave the church is not completed. The doors are still open in this dispensation. And according to the prayer Christ prayed in the garden, God's people will be one, both Jew and Gentile. Paul said in Ephesians 1 and 10 that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The Bible teaches that when this is completed by Christ, when the gathering is done, He will come back for His bride, and she will be ready. 
Now, this area of North Carolina has been called the Cradle of Pentecost. It was in the late 1800s that there was a mighty outpouring of the Spirit here, and the results were far-reaching. At the Sheriff's Schoolhouse, which was just a few miles from this location, more than 100 people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost at a meeting there. The believers were later banned from using the schoolhouse, and they built a log church house. This was burned by a mob, which had formed because they feared that awesome happening. Isaiah 60 begins with, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. This group of people who called themselves the Holiness Church at Camp Creek felt that God had given them a special revelation of God's Word, light on this side of the Dark Ages. To commemorate this revelation, the Arise, Shine marker was constructed on the site where these earnest believers made the statement that they would accept the whole Bible and walk in the light and endeavor to be the church that Christ established. Although their commitment as the Church of God to accept the whole Bible was on June 13, 1903, it was on January 26, 1906 that the small body of believers had their first assembly. Their purpose was to pray and to search the Scripture as they sought God for light. The site of this historical meeting is near the Sears Schoolhouse location, and each year a commemorative service is held in that house. The Church of God of Prophecy has marked several places of interest in addition to fields of the wood. One marker is at Kill Devil Hill in North Carolina, marking the flying of the first airplane by Wilbur and Orville Wright in December of 1903. This shows that the inventions and discoveries of man are to glorify God and to serve His purpose. Markers at other places of biblical interest include Mount Hating, where Christ called together the twelve disciples and formulated the organization for His church before His death. And in Caesarea, the Holy Ghost marker designates the place where the Gentiles first accepted the gospel and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm here at Fields of the Wood, as you already know, and I have with me a very special guest, and that guest is Jim Williams. Jim, thank you for coming and being with us. Thank you, Brother Matthew. Of course, you didn't have to come very far, did you? No, sir. <laughs> this man is the man that, that works here at Fields of the Wood and is responsible for many areas, and tell me what kind of work you do actually do here. Well, we maintain all the grounds, keep up all the equipment, and try to keep it just beautiful for our people to come in to enjoy. Well, good, and how much is that when you say all the grounds? How much are you talking about? Well, we have about? about 200 acres, uh, a little over 200 acres, uh, seems like about 300 acres when you start cutting grass. I guarantee you, as we look at all this, we can see that, and uh, you've got it mighty pretty here, Jim, and yeah, thank only, the Lord for that. There's only about 100 acres in grass, but it keeps you pretty busy. We enjoy it. How many people do you have working with you here? Uh, during the summertime, our peak season, we have about six uh, full-time people cutting grass, keeping things clean, doing painting for the monuments. And then you have a gift store and a small snack bar or restaurant up there, right. too. Our Bible bookstore is probably rate one of the tops. It's beautiful. I was going to ask you about that. Here you're out in the mountains. Uh, you, do you pretty well supply the people of this area in Christian reading and things of that nature, gifts? Well, we have a, a, a beautiful line of gifts and all the Christian material. We're just beginning to pick up some of our local churches and uh -huh. our church groups are coming in and buying uh, music and study materials. And so we're really excited about that. And then do you have a lot of purchases from people that just come through? Uh, yes, we do have a lot of purchases from people coming through. On a busy day, Jim, and I say a well, weekend, what kind of people would you have here? Well, we have different church groups from probably all around. Uh, we may have about five, six uh, church groups come in in buses, from uh -huh. 50 to 60 people per bus. Uh, they will have services at different locations on the grounds. Uh, they have services at Golgotha. Uh, mm -hmm. We had one group came in and had communion at Golgotha there, mm -hmm. and we have them go up to the altar. They worship at the altar. They may have a religious service at the top of the mount or baptismal service. Yeah, well, I noticed you have a baptismal pool just over here now. Anybody that wants to can come in and baptize right. as long as they're Christian people. Right. Huh? That's right. Most of the time we don't know they're going to have a baptismal service till all of a sudden there's a group around and they start having a baptismal service. And then a lot of the other people will come around, the visitors will come around and listen and watch the group and join right in with the singing <laughs> and the worshiping. That's good. So nice. just have church anywhere, huh? Right. You know, I've been to a lot of places, but I've never been to any place like this. Now, what do people say when they come for their first time? Well, it's, they're just amazed that, that this is here. They just, it's just awesome. Uh, they're just amazed at how beautiful it is and the Spirit of God that they feel uh -huh. as they come in the gates. We have had people come in. Uh, one man came in uh, a couple of months ago and said that he'd been to the Holy Land. He toured all over there, but when he came through the gates and onto the ground, he felt the power of God and the presence is of God like, right? like he never felt, not even when he was over there. 
Well, I trust that you've enjoyed your day in Fields of the Wood. I'm quite confident that it's been a most unique and spiritual and uplifting day for you. And we trust that you'll come back to see us whenever you can. You'll find a warm welcome here. The people will let you know that they're glad to have you. They'll minister to you any way that you can. You come and relax and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Well, as you can see, the sun is getting low, so I guess it's time for us to go. God bless you. Your tour of Fields of the Wood has taken you from the valley to the mountain tops. Hopefully, you felt the Spirit of God in this place where the scriptures have been put on tables of stone for you to read. Why not plan your next vacation to include a trip to this unique biblical park? It's situated in the Smoky Mountains near Murphy, North Carolina, Ducktown, and the great Copper Hills of Tennessee. Fields of the Wood is just off U.S. Highway 64 going west from Murphy toward Cleveland, Tennessee. The mighty white water of the Ocoee River is within minutes, as is the famous Box River. So this is an invitation. Visit Fields of the Wood. You'll find it an unforgettable experience. <laughs>